What's going on, people? We're back. May is officially over. We are into June, one of the most always kind of interesting and curious months of the summer season. And after quite, I would say, a disappointing start to the summer, we have a triple header to kick off June. Uh, we've got Bad Boys, Ride or Die. We have the premiere of Disney's latest Star Wars uh, series, The Acolyte. And we have the release of the Richard Linklater and Glenn Powell team-up effort known as Hitman. Luke, we're back. We ready to talk about these. We are so back. Yes. Back like never before. Like never before, indeed. All of that and more on today's episode of the Talking TV podcast. Stay tuned. Luke, I, I don't think that we've had an episode yet so far this year that I feel like perfectly sums up like kind of everything that the Talking TV podcast is, which is that we have a traditionally released theatrical movie. We have a straight to streaming series, right? Mini series, series they haven't really decided yet. And then we have something that's sort of kind of in between a movie that premiered at film festivals, was doing very, very well there, and then got scooped up by Netflix and released as their, like, summer blockbuster. It's very strange how kind of all three of these ended up on the same weekend, especially after relatively a disappointing box office for May. Furiosa and Fall Guy both unfortunately kind of plummeted at the box office. I believe the only financially profitable movie that came out of the month of May was Kingdom of the Planet of the Apes, and even so, the reviews for that one were kind of iffy, to say the least. But this weekend, it seems like we're sort of back with the traditional blockbuster weekend. Like I said, we got Bad Boys, we got The Acolyte, and we got... Hitman, all three of these, I think, are kind of like varying overall quality, and there are interesting discussions to be had about all of these. But we're going to kick it off with Bad Boys. I mean, you can't get more of a traditional, fun Hollywood franchise and blockbuster if you tried. Um, obviously, the first two were released by Michael Bay. Uh, the first one being actually his directorial debut, released in 95. And then the second one, you know, kind of represented the shift in his filmography as we talked about two years ago on our Bayhem episode and I mean it's safe to say that the second one might be one of the greatest not only sequels one of the greatest action movies ever made um and then we have about a 20 year almost a 20 year gap between two and three and then it's reported that after years of trying to get him back Will Smith and Martin Lawrence are coming back to do three Michael Bay's not returning to direct instead we have these two new guys who will simply go by the name Adil and Bilal this movie's really the third one Bad Boys for Life is released in January of 2020 and because 2020 ended up going the way that it was, ended up being the most financially profitable movie released in that entire year. Not to mention probably the highest grossing movie released in January ever, I think. I, I would have to check the stats on that. But, I mean, the third one just, like, made us realize and remember what it is that we loved about these two and about these movies in general and specifically, like, their dynamic. But I feel like now with the last one and this one, Adil and Bilal kind of nailed something that Michael Bay... Let's be honest, it's never been his strong suit, which is the plot and the story, if you will. Now, granted, again, these movies have never been kind of known for their stories. You know, we don't watch them for their stories. We watch them because we love seeing Will Smith and Martin Lawrence and their banter back and forth. And I would argue that this one probably has the weakest story. But, like, look, do we even care at this point if the story's weak, if it's got everything else that we love? No, I pointed out, like, in my, in my letterbox review, it's typical bad boy shtick, but who cares? It's the chemistry between the two that's that's more than enough to, to carry the load of the of the rest of the movie and the supporting cast, like, okay, the villain, maybe not great, but the, the other people that they're with, uh, the Vanessa Hudgens and the, and the, Alexander guy, the guy, the guy that maybe looks like a more buff version of me. Um, <laughs> if, if I'm being generous to myself. Um, yeah. You remember, yeah, I remember the first hunger games movie. Yeah. He's in that. Yeah. Yeah. That guy. And, uh, and the Armando, uh, We'll talk about it later, but friend yeah. of the show Elliot had a great tweet suggesting that they should make a bad sons with him and Reggie. Yeah, I mean, <laughs> if there was ever a setup for like a future of this franchise after Smith and Lawrence, because like as as much as we love those two, they're not exactly spring chickens. They're both in their mid fifties, you know now, you know, and especially when you consider that. Now, between the last one and this one, mortality seems to be a thing that these directors are really focusing. Where at the beginning of the first one, of the last one, I should say. Will Smith gets shot and is in a coma. 
for like the first 20 minutes of the movie. And then in this one, Martin, the movie literally opens with Martin Lawrence having a heart attack at Will Smith's wedding. Like, so, so these movies are very clearly interested, at least for the first 20 or 30 minutes before we get into the normal bad boy shenanigans in the mortality of these two characters. So that's kind of where I first got to give them credit. And then you're right. Like, the, the movie just kind of devolves into typical bad boy shenanigans. You know, just Martin Lawrence making dumb cracks at Will Smith, just constantly, like, commenting on how dumb he is and everything. And this movie, like, the, I feel like since the last one was focused so heavily on Will Smith and, you know, definitely after the effects of the slap, they're like, yeah, okay, Will, we got to we gotta pull you back a bit. You know, Hollywood, people, people are still not sure how they feel about you, so we got to kind of remind people why it is that they love you. And so this just kind of gives Martin Lawrence the chance to cook. And, oh, man, there's a reason why they originally there's a re, there's a reason why Michael Bay was kind of a genius when he cast two sitcom stars for these parts because oh man the level of banter and one liners that these two have available in their uh what's it called in their cachet it's never ending to say the least and it, it's always entertaining i mean i mean I, like you can never not be entertained by these two that's why like i kind of don't understand like criticisms of these movies where it's like you kind of only watch these for one thing you know you it's one of the few franchises left in Hollywood. I can't even really say this about Fast and Furious because even Fast and Furious, I thought I knew what to expect. And then Fast X came out and just blew that all up. Um, like it's one of the few franchises left where you know what to expect and like can get a solid, enjoyable time. And I feel like that's kind of part of the reason why people are having such a time with this summer is that like last year, it felt like there was an endless effort of kind of a return to normal with blockbusters and this year it feels like they're taking more risks which is i'm usually not opposed to as this is for the most part i've enjoyed a majority of the movies that have come out but it feels like regular average moviegoers really kind of don't know like what to watch and as a result if there's even that little bit of indecision there i mean we already know that they they that people are already having a hard enough time leaving the house when it comes to find new entertainment and you know movie theaters are not doing anything to help with that but it's kind of nice when you have like sort of some sort of familiarity, especially in the summer, which is when, you know, the time when people are just really trying to have fun, you know, and especially given that like, you know, movies already have all the competition in the world in the summer, given, you know, the warm weather, vacations, beaches, just spending time, really spending time outside. You know, the summer movie season, I feel like has really ha always had a hard time with that, but especially in recent years. So I like that this movie and kind of come along and remind us exactly what it, why it is that we go to the movies. Because I saw this with my friend Kyle last night. We were just having an absolute blast, cracking up nonstop at all the jokes that were thrown in. Um, this movie adds a, takes away and adds a couple of more supporting players this time. Um, they subtract Jacob Mel uh, sorry, they subtract Charles Melton, who was part of the original three new supporting cast members in the last one. You know, because he's now kind of like a big Oscar player with his breakout role really in May, December. But I thought that he was probably one of the most entertaining parts of the last one. So I was kind of sad to see him not here in this one. But they've clearly replaced him with the Jacob Scipio character with Armando, Will Smith's bastard son, who he found out about at the end of the last one. Uh, you know, due to his affair with the Bruja Witch, as Martin Lawrence continually reminds him. Uh, it's just one of my favorite parts. The last one was when Martin Lawrence is fighting with her. And then he literally gives off the one-liner, let that be a, wet, a, a lesson to your witch ass which is one of the greatest one-liners possibly I've ever heard in a movie recently. So I guess for starters, like, I mean, what 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 did you think of, like, the plot of this one? Did it really matter, you know? Because at the end of the day, we've got, like, corruption that goes up to the top. But, like, do, do we even know anything about, like, Eric Dane's character or his motivation other than, oh, he's a former army ranger and he went undercover with the, with, with the cartels and he got tortured and now... He's going to steal their money. And then you have a twist that I predicted from the minute that the I predicted this too. No, from the minute the credits roll, you see Mr. Fantastic, aka Ian Gruffin. And the minute you you see his name, you don't even need to see his face. You're like, bad guy, bad guy. I thought, and like, I thought, oh, oh, this this is San Andreas again. He, he literally turned out to be a douchebag in that one. He's gonna be a douchebag in this one. And so. he gets a ridiculous over-the-top death in both of those two. So in both that one and this one. As this is this goes so out of their way with the Chekhov's gun intro. I'm like, okay, like we, we know who's who's getting eaten by the giant alligator. Like some shit straight out of Peter Pan ultimately. But of course, it gives Martin Lawrence an excuse to crack one of the funniest things, uh, one of the funniest lines he's ever had, where he tries to calm down the alligator and then it bites his hand. And it's an albino alligator. So he's like, man, that alligator's racist, which is just, it, it's incredible. Martin Lawrence never change. Um, in terms of de this movie dealing with the uh, own inherent morality of the characters, um, th this movie kind of gets a little Deadpool-ish in the beginning. 
Well, I, you, you know what sequence I'm talking about? When Martin Lawrence, like, has the heart attack at Will Smith's wedding, and he, like, has a vision of, like, the afterlife where he sees Joe Pantoliano's character, Captain Howard, who unfortunately died in the last one, and he's, like, talking to a parrot, and it's like, oh, it's not your time yet. And then he comes back, and the whole rest of the movie, he's basically seeing, like, I can't die. That's, like, his whole shtick for the movie. And so throughout the movie, he's doing all these dumb things that, like, Will Smith is constantly attempting to have to save him. Like, he walks out in the traffic. He's dancing, just show, whipping out his dick to show off on top of a hospital room. Like, Martin Lawrence is living large in this movie. And I'm all here for it. As soon as I was talking with a couple of friends, and we were basically saying how, like, the entirety of the Bad Boys movies is basically just, like, kind of, like, degraded Martin Lawrence's body. Like, he's almost died, like, a couple times, both on set of the movies and off. You know, like, he almost died when he was going for a run in L.A. in a really, really hot day, and his body was almost, like, completely dehydrated to the point where he almost went into anaphylactic shock in real time. So the fact that, like... Honestly, he's in the best shape of his life, and he kind of gets to carry this movie in a way that Will Smith really, I mean, obviously it's a two-handed effort, but in a way that Will Smith kind of carried the last three is kind of nice and satisfying, to say the least. Not to mention, I mean, you want to talk about how well these movies tied to the last couple. Can we, like, that action sequence in the middle with Reggie, holy shit, like, oh man. man. The, the three-movie Reggie arc has been, like, a, a sneaky incredible like just how it's how it's blossomed from from a, a joke scene in the second one to him just appearing in the third one like hey that's a that's a nice callback and now he's like a fan favorite again through his like an incredible action sequence yeah we'll talk we'll talk about action in a bit but yeah uh the plot wise there was just enough of a plot to get me going like okay and the action of course that supplements a lot of it um and martin lawrence yeah I weirdly got like a Red Dead Redemption 2 vibe with the seeing visions and the albino crocodile at the end, um, which is a, a weird connection, I'm sure. But that's just that's just the type of connections I make. Well, it's interesting that you bring that up as far as both the action and kind of the video game references, because there are definitely points where Adil and Bilal, as far as being kind of action aficionados, you know, obviously, you know, you had Stahelski and David Leach revolutionizing it with um, what's it called? Revolutionizing the uh revolutionized the gun the, the gun foo with the gun foo right and now it's literally gotten to the point where like we're introducing like first person shooter into like action movies that are not based on video games where the final action sequence you literally have a scene where will smith and martin lawrence and, and you even see all the behind the scenes that are released on instagram and everything too where you literally have their the camera rigs are strapped to them as they're going throughout and like it's spinning back and forth between them as it goes to the gun you literally feel like you're in a first person shooter video game i mean the way that that, that these two shoot action is really incredible with the pans and swoops it's like michael bay but like upped a little you know it's really the, really the new generation of bays it really is and, and i mean the, the the drone inclusion i mean come on he started a revolution with ambulance and now everyone's doing they tried to do it in the gray man it was terrible uh but here they they're the valedictorians of the michael bay they school really are of drone photography they really are they're the, they're kind of the saviors of the last act of this movie you know where like you literally just have drones coming in and just dr literally dropping bombs on enemy snipers and such um i also forgot to mention that Rhea seahorn is also in this movie as the late captain howard's daughter and along with eric dane that's two actors that were like really really good in recent tv shows her on better call saul and eric dane on euphoria and they're kind of wasted in these generic one-off parts where Rhea Seahorn's like, oh, I want revenge for my dad. Especially when she finds, you know, especially when, you know, she's mad at Will Smith because it's like, yeah, your son killed my dad, you know. And she even says your bastard son to his face. I was like, oh, god damn. And then you have Eric Dane as like the generic bad guy. You know, he was actually had like a really kind of interesting and compelling arc as, as, as uh, Jacob Elordi's dad on Euphoria. And... Man, that guy's come a long way since playing multiple man in X-Men The Last Stand. You know, it's kind of crazy when I see when I saw that name and I'm like, wait a minute, Eric Dane. I'm like, didn't that guy play multiple man in, in X-Men The Last Stand? And now he's here and he's just playing, you know, generic evil villains. And yeah, it's it's kind of a tragic waste of both of them. Um, I mean, the, I mean, it, like I said, it, it, it gets to they get some compelling arcs. I mean, I guess some, some good moments of screen time for sure. But like I said, they're kind of just there as plot devices. I also have to say, I was not a fan of how they kind of downgraded Paula Nunez, who was like, probably, again, the scene stealer of the last one, where she comes in as like, potentially a love interest for Will Smith's character. And she just absolutely steals every scene that she's in, both action-wise and looks-wise. And in this one, she's relegated to being like, oh, she's 
engaged in dating the current potential mayor, who's not at all evil, played by <laughs> Oyen Gruffin. And I'm just like, man, what a downgrade, honestly. Like, probably one of the dumbest parts of the movie is when, like, it's revealed that, oh, he's the bad guy. And, um, and then she like, he like corners them in the elevator. It's like a really bad scene. It's not good. And it's kind of predictable. And then she like gets a cool action sequence at the end. Also, like, again, what are, what are the, what are the few, uh, franchises to bring in like a new cast of supporting characters, like back at the main characters and have them actually be useful and pretty cool. Like, I, I still think that one of the funniest parts of the last one is when the Alexander Ludwig character is, like, purposely, like, you know, kind of calm and docile. And, and even though he's, like, six foot five and jacked, he prefers to be, he, like, prefers to be the tech guy because he, like, when he loses control, he gets a little bit over the top and just goes nuts and kills everybody. And I love how in the last one, like, Will Smith is, like, encouraging him to go. And he's like, don't worry, big man, I'll pay for your therapy afterwards. I just thought that bit was hilarious. And, yeah, like I said, these movies are back. They're fun. They're enjoyable. Uh, with the way that they're going, I feel they could make like five more of these movies. They could make them the exact same movie. They're still going to be fun and entertaining every time. You know, it just comes in under two hours. They don't overstay their welcome. And like I said, as far as I'm setting up Armando and Reggie, I mean, I kind of want, I kind of want to see the the future, like Bad Boys, the Next Generation, and it's those two. You know, like because I, I I can honestly see that being really sick. Because again, with one sequence, Reggie kind of steals the movie, especially after Martin Lord's already making a joke about how he was just kind of sitting around, and he's like. I'm a retired, he's like, I'm, I'm a Marine. I, I'm like, I just got deployed and now I'm back. And he's like, you need to get a job. And then yeah. he ends up like totally redeeming himself. <laughs> it's just great. I, I will say I did get a little sick of the trailer, but seeing before every movie. Yeah. But, but it, it was worth it. Like, yeah. like you can get the trailer and it'd be a bad movie, but this one, it, it yeah. lives up. This and, one, it and lives all up those to movie, it. All those moments are just a lot funnier in, yeah. in full context of the movie. Well, also not to mention the fact that the trailer are are so like gratuitous in terms of giving you like in terms of giving you like the whole movie this trailer gives you the entire movie um it gives you the entire movie the, like the entire first half of the movie pretty much like a almost almost to a t so it's just in terms of like wow i am really trying to avoid trailers going forward because they just they they like you literally you get the entire movie it's like people wonder why like these studios wonder why nobody's going to see these movies in theaters and it's like maybe because they know everything that's going to happen in the movie just by watching the trailer you know i've been saying this for eight years now since batman versus superman and hollywood has unfortunately not learned any of their lessons so yeah i don't know we'll see where it goes forward we got two other things to talk about before we head out of here but luke what is your final thoughts and star ratings for Bad Boys Ride or Die? My final thoughts. What, what a movie! What a great opening to the to the June to the June part of, of the summer season. Um, and I, I want to see like three more at least. Uh, Honestly, but Adil and Bilal. Look, there were those rumors. They want to do Spider Man. Let them do Spider Man. You'll Spider -Man. get the greatest Spider Man action sequences in history. Uh, I I could just imagine like him fighting Scorpion oh or, or something. If, if if they were just, to do like well, who are the villains that are rumored? If it's like Scorpion, if it's like uh, Mister yeah, Negative, uh, well Kingpin, yeah, but there was one other one. And Shocker, if it was, uh, and they, I think they were gonna bring back Shocker as well. It's like Shocker, Scorpion, and Mister Negative. And if Daredevil's in there, oh my god, it'll 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 be the greatest Spider. And there's the greatest... then the symbiote's always oh yeah crawling yeah, around. Of course, always. so uh, four four stars. Yeah, I, I would agree. I gave this one four stars. It was really solid. My only kind of nitpick critique besides kind of the wasting of Seahorn and Eric Dane is uh, I think they screwed up with the titles. I think the last one should have been Ride or Die, and I think this one should have been For Life since it's, you know, the fourth one. Kind of a, kind I, of a I, th I thought they, they didn't know they were going to do a fourth one. Yeah, they, they clearly didn't know they were going to do a fourth one, but still, like, it, 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 a missed opportunity, guys. But like, it made it, a lot of money, so people clearly want to see yes. more Will Smith. Yes, indeed. Chris What's Rock it? was deserved. To Chris, be uh, yeah, Chris, Chris Rock <laughs> apparently wasn't enough. He wasn't enough. I guess Chris Rock's got to make his own version of Bad Boys now. All right, moving on. Uh, next hey, we have the boys. The uh, boys. <laughs> Uh, what's and they still don't know the words to that freaking song. Like, guys, no. it's been 20 years. You still haven't learned the words to those to that song. It's not that hard. Google like like YouTube music and Spotify lyrics are a thing. Um, uh, anyway, so moving on to the acolyte. So this is an interesting one. As we know, Disney has been in a little bit of a rough patch for the last couple of years, particularly with Star Wars. I think it's safe to say that their efforts on Disney Plus have not been as uh, fulfilling as we would have hoped, considering that after the first two seasons of Mandalorian, which were pretty freaking awesome, we were unfortunately inundated with such disappointing efforts as The Book of Boba Fett, uh, Obi-Wan Kenobi, 
Uh, Andor was a nice, refreshing surprise in terms of how excellent it was. And then Andor was unfortunately followed up by The Mandalorian Season 3 and Ahsoka, which were both better, I would say, than the efforts that we got in 2022, but still not enough to, uh, to, to really, I would say, like, um, prove that Disney is kind of back with Star Wars. Uh, you know, and unfortunately, it has not uh, show, really proven that Star Wars really should be making any more live action efforts outside of their animated efforts, which for the which again have been great. Bad Batch season three just wrapped up its run earlier this year, and I thought it was a, a once again an incredibly touching and a heartfelt finale. It's a great way to say goodbye to those characters that we've spent the last couple of years with. And now we have the Acolyte, which this is an interesting one because this is be do, so. This is a show that takes place about a hundred years before the events of Phantom Menace, so during the High Age of the Republic. It's got an entirely brand new cast, and due to the nature of when it takes place within the Star Wars canon, at least to my knowledge, we don't have any familiar characters that we're known with. So this is kind of breaking new ground in a sense. Yo Yoda can show up. That's, uh, he probably will. Well, Yoda can show up for sure, but for the most part, he hasn't. And this is the first Star Wars property that is finally dealing with characters and storylines we are unfamiliar with that we that we have not seen before, right? It's got a... Pretty loaded, very diverse cast, as we know. Definitely measure up to Disney's new diversity and equity inclusion standards. Um, consisting of Amanda Stenberg, Lee Jung Jai, uh, Daphne Keene, uh, Manny Jacinto, Charlie Bartlett. Um, what's it called? A couple other faces. Jody Turner-Smith is in here as well. And they, they uh, this the series is showrun by Leslie Headland who directed a film back in 2015 that I was a very big fan of. It's a movie called Sleeping With Other People with Jason Sudeikis and Alison Brie. It's a very, very good movie, very charming, a good spin on the rom-com genre. I would definitely recommend checking that out. And after watching the first two episodes of this series, uh, they're releasing it weekly, I gotta say, I'm intrigued. I don't hate it, but I don't love it. You know, it's not, I will say that kind of the fact that these are entirely new characters definitely has me intrigued to say the least to follow the story as far as seeing where it's going to go. Because I feel this is the first time I'm watching a Star Wars show and I don't know where it's going to go. Because even with Ahsoka, even though that takes place after Rebels, because that's still in that space of, you know, Mandalorian, a book of Boba Fett, where it's kind of that era right after the events of Return of the Jedi and like the kind of the construction of the New Republic and, and, and the fall of the Empire. I feel like I'm still kind of familiar with that, not to mention the fact that since that was kind of a follow-up to the Rebels show, it really just felt like, again, continuation of arcs and characters we were, again, already familiar with. So I feel like we really weren't treading new ground. This is the first time where we essentially are. And again, we're following Amanda Stenberg's character as she plays twins, both of whom are, uh, you know, trained in the ways of the Force and the Jedi. They're orphans that were, uh, you know, unfortunately caught in a forest fire at that, 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 that destroyed their fire and killed their parents. And they were saved by four Jedi. The one was taken in by the Jedi Order and now has since left and has become like a mechanic on a ship. The other one is like become super evil, and the opening scene of the first episode is her assassinating uh, Carrie Ann Moss, who is also in the show. And it's funny because uh, with the amount of cast members that, that were in the show, I'm like, okay, we have the. This is kind of how predictable Star Wars has become. I'm like, okay, we have the one white Star Wars character who is not covered in green paint, or is not uh, Asian or black or Hispanic. Uh, yeah, dead within the opening scene. And so, because I'm like, that, that's how these things always start. They always have to kill a character off in the opening scene in order to, you know, get the plot going. And yeah, prove me exactly right. Uh, exactly right. And it's kind of going to be interesting watching the rest of the show, seeing how, like, the unfortunate reliance and still adherence to those ridiculous diversity and equity and, and inclusion standards are definitely going to kind of inhibit what could potentially be an interesting story. Again, it's, it's a little bit of an assassin and conspiracy plot. So I am intrigued. Luke, what were, what were your thoughts on these first two episodes? Look, um, Star Wars used to be my absolute number one shit. Like you remember, we did the the script reading yes. that was just just awesome. But now it's like I just cannot get excited for anything Star Wars remotely. Like I forgot, almost forgot to watch this, and then you mentioned it. Like that we were covering, oh, I have to watch it. Yeah. Uh, but it's okay. Like I, I like that it's it's sep it's completely separate from anything like like the hundred year gap like you said uh i enjoy the cast uh you know yeah squid game man i forget his name lee jung jai uh, lee jung jai the guy who stole bob right. odenkirk's emmy t uh two years ago <laughs> uh he, he he's great he's good in it uh i like amanda St stenberg uh I will say this: If I remember to, I will continue watching it because <laughs> there's there's three other shows 
coming out this yes. m- this month. The Boys, uh, House of the Dragon, and The Bear that are much bigger priority. If I remember to, I will continue watching this because I was not I was not too hooked by it. Yeah, I got again. I gotta say, like, I I liked what I saw. I, I the thing about it is, for me, I like this era of Star Wars. This is probably my favorite era of Star Wars. You know, the era of the High Republic in the sense of where because we're told so much about kind of like the faults and flaws of the Jedi, but actually getting to see, and, and, but, but because of the nature of the prequels, the kind of how they had to go, you really didn't get a chance to like see that. And I like seeing that in real person. That's interesting. But again, you, you hit the nail on the head, which is that Star Wars has unfortunately done so much damage to its own brand since being purchased by Disney. It's like, you really can't get excited for it anymore. It's kind of lost that epic feeling and kind of it being devolved. It really just feels like, TV rather than like an event to get excited for. And it really has become more of an obligation to watch rather than something that's actually like enjoyable that people actually want to see ultimately. And it's really sad and distressing ultimately that it's come to that point, especially when they could be good, you know, and or prove that 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 uh, there are still ca- people capable of telling good stories within the Star Wars universe, but unfortunately, man, like if if they just keep going with this direction, you know, we've got we've got Skeleton Crew in that's coming out in December. You know, they've greenlit all of these movies that who the hell knows if they're ever going to get made. Supposedly, Mandalorian and Grogu is coming out in May of 2026. We'll see you, if that did actually you see happens. What the, the Minions marketing team did. No, I did not. In Despicable Me 4, there's these mega minions. Basically, like I did the see Fantastic the trailer for that 4. yesterday, yeah. And, and there's a video of Steve Carell like announcing like 80 years of mega minions movies. So, <laughs> it's very much like a Marvel phase That's 6 funny. kind of look. So, and this is just another example of that. Every, yeah. like, when, like when they made those announcements about the, what is it, the... Well, it was the, the Ray the, movie, the High Republic movie that James Mangold was supposed to do, yeah. and then the Mandalorian movie yeah. that uh, I'm, like, I'm like, maybe one of these will get made. Yes, if <laughs> any. Other, if any. Uh, They're still no, very we, we actually have a release date for the Mandalorian yeah. one. So uh yeah. But but whatever. Uh, yeah, because people love Grogu. They love those Grogu plush dolls. But uh, yeah, there's there's nothing that can get me excited like ep- and they're gonna do episode x at this point like I'm, yeah. I'm convinced yeah they will they will yeah it's it's distressing honestly it really is you know like the disney unfortunately is really of, of all the franchises that have kind of been tarnished recently disney really has done the most damage to the star wars brand and kind of and it's one of those things where everybody knows it kind of universally it's known kathleen kennedy has kind of done a really really terrible job of managing and mismanaging the brand and kind of driving it into the ground all of the problems that have come with all the previous properties that have just been really kind of disappointing overall. They really have become more of an obligation and and a chore really to get through rather than something that actually get excited about. Yeah, I mean, I've only seen the first two episodes, so I can't really say I am going to make an attempt to continue watching this going forward. But yeah, like you said, we have the boys on Thursday. We have House of the Dragon on Sunday. And then we have the bear two weeks after that. Like we, 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 are, we have our TV obligations set as far as for both June and the rest of the summer goes. So, like I said, we'll 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 keep this conversation nice and short because there is another streaming title that I do want to get to, uh, rather than the acolyte, and that is Hitman. Now, this is an interesting one. So, before we get into the co- topic of conversation, there's a reason why this one I think merited the most amount of conversation. What did you hear and know about this movie before watching it? Well, I think it premiered at TIFF, right? And yeah. I, I know some people who saw it there, and they really enjoyed it. And then I know some people who saw it at some kind of somewhere in England, it's one of those film festivals, and they really enjoy it. Like, this is this is gonna be hit, man. Uh, to steal the obvious joke there. Uh, so I was very excited for it. I saw it actually had a Latvian release in theaters. I was gonna go see it, but I was writing my thesis, and yeah. by the time I finished, it was on streaming. So I figured I'm just gonna watch it there. Yeah. Uh, and I knew it's Richard Linklater. I've only seen School of Rock, but I that was really good. So I I do. And Glenn Powell, he's just emerging. He's everywhere. He's going to be in Twisters as well. And he's just great and everything. So it was everything. Everything was lined up for it to be a great movie. And it, it was. Yeah. There's a couple of like preliminaries that I want that I want to read off before uh, before we actually talk about this movie. And uh, for the first things first, being all of the movies that I've seen Glenn Powell in, um, so, 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 some including uh, you know Spy Kids 3D Game Over, uh, Expendables Three. Ride Along 2, he's got a bit part in. Uh, a couple other gems, you know, some really, really... 
The Dark Great Knight Netflix Rises. Gem, you know, set it up. The Dark Knight Rises. Obviously, he's one of the stock exchange brokers that gets kidnapped by Bane. His infamous line: "This is the stock exchange. There's no money here." And Bane's like, "Really? Then why are you here?" Uh, it's it, it's it's absolutely great. You know, he's recently, obviously, again, he broke out in Top Gun. He recently spoke about how, uh, you know, Top Gun getting delayed really cost him like some money, which again, okay. Um, and then, uh, you know, recently this past Christmas with anyone but you, but yeah, Hollywood, Hollywood hasn't done this in a while where they're really trying to tout like their new golden boy. Like this is it. This is the new it man. This is the new guy to follow. This is our new movie star. Right. And I, I, I don't know if anybody remembers this, but I seem to remember when Hollywood tried to do this really hard with Sam Worthington and Taylor Kitsch back in the early 2010s around like circa 2009 and 2012. And well, we all know how that went for those two, you know, with Taylor Kitsch having back-to-back -back bombs with John Carter and Battleship in the same year and Sam Worthington leading the highest grossing movie of all time, Avatar, and then following that up with Man on a Ledge and some other really, really Clash excellent of the Titans. movies. Clash, Clash of the Titans. Yeah, yeah, proven my point. So let's just say that while... I, I do like Glenn Powell. I do think that he does have charm and does have the capabilities to be a good leading man. I do worry that he is kind of getting suckered into a position that ultimately has proven to fail more people recently, especially since we are living in the age of IP and streaming. And it is really hard for kind of movie stars to break through, honestly, you know? I, I feel like people have been having a lot more success with that on TV rather than, um, rather than film. And... So there's that. Then you have the Richard Linklater pieces where Richard Linklater has probably got one of the most fascinating filmographies ever. And there's really two types of movies that he really likes to do. The movies that I think he thrives in, which are, again, the down-to-earth movies just about, like, people being people and dealing with, like, love, tragedy, uh, you know, the mundanity of life. Such efforts are, 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 that, that I think really demonstrate this are, you know, Days and Confused, School of Rock which ironically is a paycheck job for him. Like, I think it's really funny that, like, that's considered a Richard Linklater movie when I'm like, yeah, that, that, that this is so clearly a paycheck job for him, but he just does it really well. Like, the script and the, and the lead performance from Jack Black are so good and carry that movie. Um, the Before Trilogy, obviously, uh, being one of his uh, one, one of his most well-known ones. And then, obviously, what I think is probably one of his most underrated efforts, that being um, Last Flag Flying with Steve Carell, Brian Cranston, and Lawrence Fishburne, which is just... So touching and heartbreaking. Those, to me, are where he really thrives and really, really does well. And then you have the movies where he likes to get weird and a little experimental. You know, he sometimes succeeds with that. Movies like Tape and A Scanner Darkly, where he experiments around with the format. Newton Boy, Suburbia. Um, and just some recent efforts that just have not worked out well. Uh, where Do You Go, Bernadette. Um, you know, there's Bernie, the movie that he did with Jack Black and Matthew McConaughey in the early 2010s, which is funny and enjoyable, but, like, he does like to get a little weird sometimes, and that's where he becomes a little bit more hit or miss. Uh, obviously, you know, and then you have his big experiment, Boyhood, which was filmed over the course of, you know, 14, 15 years, or however long that was, and, well, outside of the gimmick of the movie, it's like, I, I, I still don't think that that movie has aged very well, ironically enough. And so now you have this effort, where he is telling the story of a movie that is sort of kind of based on a true story. They were kind of vague about that, and you have Glenn Powell playing a dorky college professor who doesn't really have a social life, who moonlights as uh, as a technician guy for the FBI. And then one day is kind of basically assigned last minute, okay, you have to go in and talk to this guy and like basically like entrap them, essentially. And he loves it so much that he ends up kind of like making that like his new pastime, where he essentially ends up... Um, creating and crafting various different assorted characters in order to pose as these different hitmen in order to entrap people who want to hire hitmen in order to, you know, in order to, you know, make their lives easier. And it kind of turns into this, I, when I first started this movie, I'm like, I don't really know where this is going. But then about the middle half, I'm like, okay, I think I see where this is going, especially when Adria Arjona comes in. And I'm just like, oh, put her in more movies, please. Because she has been one that is, again, it's just some some hits, some misses, to say the least, over the last couple of years. Definitely some 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 better efforts on TV, you know, with her turn in the second season of True Detective and uh, and Andor, ironically as well. Um, so she, she's had some, she's had some hits, to say the least. But I mean, she just stuns the minute that she walks in on stage and uh, on screen, I should say. And the movie kind of she again, she it, makes it a stage. She, that, she that's just truly how does. she how, truly how she does. I mean, good lord! I don't remember the last time that I've seen someone that just won me over 
like instantly, like by being just that effortlessly gorgeous and attractive. Not to mention that, like, oh man, we finally have a sexy movie again. We finally have a sexy movie in, 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 in an age that has almost completely killed off sex in movies. We finally got a sexy movie back. And, um, so like I said, the, the middle act of the movie is really probably where this movie hits the highest, where it's this really interesting uh, talk on identity and like kind of, you know, living in, kind of coming into your own, becoming confident uh, in terms of pursuing exactly what you want, but also kind of what the twist off to that is, you know, where, where is the line as far as, um, as, as far as. Um, you know, when, when is going too far? Like, is this guy actually a sociopath? Because again, the amount of research that he's putting into it. And then the second half kind of does this really interesting twist where it kind of turns into like this old fashioned noir where he realizes that this character that he's fallen madly in love with is like a lot more devious than, than he previously thought. And he realizes that he's kind of gotten himself into hot water. And then we get to the third act. And I would say for me, and, and I'll, I'll let you know, and, and let me know if you agree with this or not, but this movie has a very clear direction that it's going in terms of where if it had ended in a certain way, I think it would have been phenomenal. And this would be one of the best movies of the year. That is not the ending that we got. And the ending that we got instead, I have to say, I'm not going to lie, might be one of the dumbest endings I've seen of any movie this year. And really, I think, ruins what is otherwise a pretty awesome and 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 pretty thought provoking movie in a manner that I was certainly not expecting. So 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 your thoughts are, and like I said, this movie was getting rave reviews coming out of all the festivals. TIFF they loved it. New York Film Festival they loved it. And then you know you have the Netflix of it all, where Netflix kind of kind of scoops in and took what otherwise might have been a pretty interesting and different sort of maybe awards movie, and they drop it as a kind of their summer blockbuster. Netflix is really weird when it comes to summer blockbusters. But so now kind of we're in this situation and I wanted to know first your thoughts on the movie and then like if you agree with me on my thoughts on the ending. Well, I, I enjoyed the movie for the most part. It, 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 like you said, it's it's like an old school movie with a with a modern coat of paint, if you will. Uh, it, it was one thing and then it turns into another thing. Like it's kind of a rom-com type of situation. Uh, but I do agree. The ending was, I was a bit, huh? Yeah. That's, that's it? And and. But it didn't ruin the movie for me. I still would give it a, a fairly high rating, um, and I would recommend it because because the rest of it was just that good, and uh, the chemistry between them oh, yeah. was like unreal, oh, yeah. effort effortless. So, well, because you know you know what it is. It's that thing of where like. I really, really want to enjoy it, but there's not enough throughout the movie for me to enjoy. Like I said, I really like Glenn Powell. I really like Adria Arjona. But like everything else, like like the dumb little supporting characters and everything that are kind of just there as comic relief, and they kind of like turn it like like the Retta and 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 the and the other guy, you know, the Indian guy. They kind of like ground it and turn it into like almost like a sitcom essentially, and it kind of takes away for me from more of the serious dramatic elements and like the moments where he is like coming up with all of these different characters with all these different crazy looks and accents and everything. Like he gets to be a redneck, he gets to be this crazy, insane British character. I think he does he a Russian accent Bateman. at one point. He gets to be Patrick Bateman. Right, he gets to be like all these different characters, and I'm just waiting. And I'm like, I really need to see like some sort of a really interesting payoff because he's kind of putting a little bit. To, and like, obviously, yeah, they set him up as like this bored college professor who kind of does this just on the side, right? And and like Glenn Powell proves that he can be like a solid actor and movie star. Like he handles all the beats really well. He does all of the, all you know. He does all of that stuff really, really well. I think kind of the back and forth between like, you know, how he like carefully constructs this awesome, confident character that the Andrea Arjona character completely falls in head over heels for. And like, again, it's kind of awesome when you're seeing him like, and you're like, wow, he's playing a character, but he's really this like kind of this dorky, like kind of, you know, uh, you know, isolated loner weirdo. And I thought that part was really fascinating, but I'm like, I needed to see more. I needed to see like a deeper dive into that psychology. We got a little bit of it in the beginning when he's talking with his ex-wife. And I thought that conversation was like really fascinating how she's like breaking down the different elements of personality. And that was a really good setup, but I needed to see kind of a little bit more in terms of like, kind of what his motivation was you know like maybe like maybe like an extra scene or two that really breaks down psychology wise like what it is that he's feeling when he's like adopting all these characters you know and he and he has that scene in the courtroom as well where he's kind of where, where like the law where like the lawyer is trying to say like yeah you're basically entrapping these guys you know at what point kind of is it that you know, that that you know you you are these characters at what point does it stop being a job for you and he kind of like again like kind of 
dives into and 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 uses some of that newfound confidence that he has in order to um in, in order to throw up the lawyer's questions. I think the biggest thing about this movie is that it's a great movie for if you want to just watch good, interesting acting. Because, like, from an actor standpoint, this is definitely one of the more fascinating movies that has come out this year, where you are essentially watching a guy play one guy that then has to become all this assortment of other characters. And that's kind of, to me, where the intrigue comes in. And the rest of the movie, right, is kind of, again, this, like, think piece, noir, rom-com. It's playing around with genres, which I do like. I do really, really like that. Just, man, that ending. Like, to break it down for people, you essentially have it where, okay, so halfway through the movie, right, you, it, it turns out that Adria Arjona, who claimed that she was getting a divorce from her husband after she was originally going to attempt to hire Glenn Powell as the hitman to take out her husband, um, and then obviously they fall in love and everything, and she gets the divorce, so she says, but then they run into her husband outside of the club, turns out they are not getting the divorce, and he's like kind of really angry, and then the husband tries to hire Glenn Powell as the hitman. And then Glenn Powell reveals himself and the husband disappears. Next thing you know, the husband turns up dead. And Glenn Powell's like, oh, I know who did this, you know? And it's very obviously. And then Andre Arjona just tells him straight up in a scene that I was not expecting at all. She's like, oh, yeah, I killed him. And he's like, wait, what? Like, he was, he like, he so wanted it to not be her. And then it turned out it was. And I'm like, oh, well, okay. This is, this has become the noir ending. We, we know how this is going to end now. And then, so they managed to cover it up, right? Where he basically, like, manages to, you know, he's sent into a trapper. He kind of manages to fool her into not giving it away and confessing it. And they almost get away with it. But then Austin Amelio's character, Dwight from The Walking Dead, comes in and is like, yep, I figured out this whole thing. You know, I've been following you since the get-go because I wanted my job back. And now I found out that you guys concocted this whole thing. And then they, Andre Arjona drugs him and they just let him die. And then they go off and get married and have kids and live happily yeah. ever after. And I'm like, what? Like, hold on. Back up a second. Like, no cut twos. Like, no, oh, he has to explain how Austin Abelio just died. They don't show him quitting his college class. Nothing. It's just like, oh, he's just in this life now. And that's it. I'm like, I needed at least a solid 10 or 15 more minutes explaining, like, what happened in the in-between. Because that kind of, I'm sorry, that was not it. That ending was just not it. Um, as far as how this should have ended, what should have happened was, is he comes over to, uh, you know, he comes over, at, uh, you know, afterwards, after the, the fake confession and sees Austin Amelio there, she kills Austin Amelio. And then he's like, okay, everything's going to be fine. Then he kills her and then goes off and like, is like, okay, I'm in this life now. And he becomes like a real hitman. That to Ooh. me would have been. The really real, that to me is like, oh, that turns this into a, like a five-star movie, you know? Yeah, because like, I was waiting for him to be like, okay, he's actually going to have to hitman someone. Right. And then he kind of does, but it's kind of with no buildup. Not really, though, because like, she still drugs yeah. him. So he just kind of helps her out. So, like, he really he just doesn't. doesn't. He just doesn't save him. In the right, end. exactly. Just, right. Or, just or another on. version of the ending is, he, like, ends up getting her sent to jail, you know? And then she ends up, like, getting out, like, a couple years later and targets him. Like, there's so Hit many man, different... Hitman, too. Exactly. There's so <laughs> many different possibilities as far as endings that this could have gone. And they just pick, like, the worst possible ending where it's like, oh, this is a rom-com now. And I'm like, but that's not what you set up at all. Like, at all. That was, like, a an L I'm like, this was clearly a noir movie. And... It's really confusing to me for Richard Linklater, somebody who I think for the most part does understand genre pretty well. And then he goes and does this, and it just has me scratching my head being like, what the hell were we thinking here? Like, what actually happened? And honestly, it doesn't take away my ability to recommend this to people, but it does unfortunately kind of really, I think, take this down a peg because this, I, I really wanted this and this was shaping up to be one of the best movies of the year. You know, again, this was kind of released in festivals in 2023, but 20, but it's another movie that kind of, again, because of the stack nature and the strikes of, that came out in 2023, where this kind of, again, is another one that comes out in 2024 after Dune 2 and Challengers. And I got to say that, again, aside from Dune 2, kind of drops the ball, unfortunately. Pun intended, very much so, as far as the reference back to Challengers. And yeah, I really really wanted to recommend this to people. And man, I'm getting really sick of these movies because I had a lot of problems with movies that were like this that were released in the second half of the 2010s or movies that were like so close, 
so close to being awesome and then just completely dropped it at the last minute. And it really, again, unfortunately, like this uh, for the majority of this movie, I was between about a four and a four and a half. And after that ending, I got to say, this goes down to a three and a half for me. It really does because that ending kind of exposes some of the other problems that I had with the movie, you know? And as far as like my future thought process on it, I may come back to this one day and think, oh yeah, this was kind of really interesting. But as far as like this being one of the best efforts of the year, I mean, it's good, it's solid, enjoyable, but... The rest of it, yeah, I, I I don't know if I can really say that 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 I if I if I can really say I personally enjoyed this. I think people will like this purely because of the chemistry between the two leads, but that's really about it, honestly. Well, I, I would have to say that I, I they did not ruin it for me as much as it did for you. I would still very much recommend it to people. Uh, is it my top five of the year? I think it was, but it's well, been I mean, given a, just a, how been slim pickings slight, this year has a, been, a bit of a dry year. So yeah. far, yeah, it just it just nips the top five. Yeah, um, but no, I, I like the the old schoolness of it. Uh, like we sh we should have more movies of this scale, like this yes. and Challengers. Like I agree. Kind of, kind of that kind of uh, budget budget wise, and uh, just get a big 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 name actor, put some supporting actors. Boom. Yes, I Easy. agree. I agree, hundred percent. Like, and actually, like the who who said the the. the who won for American fiction best adapted screen? But oh, like, Court Jefferson. Don't make one two hundred million dollar movie. Make uh tw twenty five exactly. million dollar movies. Exactly. Yeah, and like my whole thought process is that even though this one didn't necessarily work for me, I still would like more efforts like this in the sense of where again studios divvying up their efforts and again because with this constant back and forth problem of they only ever want to make these two hundred million dollar blockbuster events when almost nobody actually goes to see movies in theaters anymore. It's like, why wouldn't you just, again, diversify your efforts, make a bunch of 40 to $50 million mid-budgeted level movies with interesting scripts, good actors, you know, that actually gives them interesting parts. Like, we do want more movies like this. I don't want that to be misconstrued. I do want more movies like this. If anything, again, I just want more of them. I just want more of a diversified palette, which is kind of what I've been complaining about really over the last couple of years. And, you know, kind of we're done with COVID now. So I'm hoping that things are going to go that way uh, ultimately. But, you know, who knows? We'll see. So as far as my final thoughts on Star Ratings, again, three and a half out of five stars, unfortunately. You know, it may go up to a four as time goes on. But for now, yeah, like I said, that ending really, really took this down a peg for what was otherwise a really interesting and different kind of a movie that I was expecting, especially from the typical summer blockbuster slate. Yeah, for, for me, it's a, it's a solid four. There's a lot of fours this year uh, between this and Abigail and uh, Challengers. Yeah, so it's, it's a very, it's a decent year so yeah. far. Just, just not a yeah, nothing, nothing like complete hitter. Yeah, amazing and groundbreaking. I would agree, honestly. It's for me other personally. Other than Dune, of course. Other than Dune and Fall Guy, and Fall Guy. Yeah, Fall Guy's but, great. But I Dune, don't... Dune's a little. Yeah, Dune. Oh, I, 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 again, it's like I said, every other movie this year could pack it up and go home after Dune, and I have not been proven wrong so far. No, I think you will. Yep, Unless... I really don't. I really, really yeah, don't. There's, there's no one less. There's there no. really is. There isn't, and it's winning Best Picture and Director. So yeah. Uh, all right. With that being said, Luke, that was it. That was our kind of kickoff to June. Uh, like I said, we've got some more interesting episodes. Like I said, I'm not sure if I'm going to do, like I said, we're so just a bit of housekeeping behind the scenes. We are officially kicking off our recap shows for the summer. We are doing the boys every Thursday night after the episode airs. Um, what's it called? Uh, and then we will be doing house of the dragon every Sunday after the episode airs. Uh, so those will be going kind of throughout the rest of June into July. Uh, and I believe August, which is when House of the Dragon will uh, season two will wrap. So those will be uh, commencing. Uh, Luke, as you also well know, Lost is premiering on July first. I still have yet to come up with a Lost release. Lost is premiering. Date. Well, sorry, <laughs> Lost is dropping all of the episodes on Netflix on July first. So we will be uh, we will be commencing that recap. I still have yet to decide whether I'm going to uh, air these episodes live on YouTube or whether I'm going to uh, release them. Uh, pre-record them, and then release them at a later date. I still have yet to decide that, but whatever the case is, I will let you know because, like I said, we are about to get lost all over again. Um, but, yeah, that's that's a behind-the-scenes uh, of, of what we have coming up on the show, on the, cha uh, on the channel. Be sure to stay tuned for all of that going forward. And uh, I also have another couple of uh, edited videos that I'm working on behind the scenes as well because I had so much fun with my top 10 movies turning 10. I want to, and now that I'm done with school and I have more time, uh, I plan on doing more of those efforts. So that's just some things to look forward to for the channel going forward. Luke, where can the good people follow you on the interwebs? 
Uh, they should follow me at Look Reviews on YouTube because someone unsubscribed yesterday. Oh. <laughs> they they will miss out on two great videos in July, hopefully. Uh, disaster movie tier list in honor of Twisters and revisiting the X Men movies of, of the Fox era one last time before before we officially shift into into the new X X Men era MCU with Deadpool and Wolverine. Uh, so we'll keep an eye out for that. And, of course, the, the Lost recap yes. series, which I'll be watching the, for the first time. So you'll be getting a diverse uh, view on things. Yes. Yes, indeed, you will. It's going to be really interesting to see your thought process of that. And, of course, people, you can follow me with everything going on at Movie Nerd Reviews across all platforms, at Official Talk and TV Podcast across all platforms. Be sure to follow. Uh, be sure to subscribe to us if you're watching us on YouTube. Follow us on Twitch. This episode will be available on Spotify and Apple Podcasts tomorrow. Like I said, we're recording this on a Monday. But I had a little bit of a... Uh, I had a little bit of a long weekend, so this episode will be available tomorrow. And as always, people, 12 seasons in a short film, and watch more fucking movies and TV. We'll see you guys next week for House of the Dragon and the boys.